If you ever wanted to take notes during a Four Boxes Diner episode, today is probably the day because we are going to do a deep dive and really get geeky uh, specifically, how do you apply historical analog laws? How to understand these, the buckets that potentially you want to put these into, how to think about this stuff conceptually, vis-a-vis -vis not just the text of the Second Amendment, but the government's burden involving what they need to do to justify a modern-day gun control law. We're going to get really geeky on this, so you do not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarm, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms, Lessons the Israelis Should Have Learned Before the Hamas Attack as well. All right, folks, so we have talked a lot on this channel about the interpretive methodology of how do you apply the Second Amendment when there is a challenge to a modern-day gun control law. How do you know whether or not it binds the Second Amendment under the Heller and Bruin uh, methodologies, how to think about it? So we've talked generally about this in many instances, but I want to really get super detailed on some fine nuanced points that I think you're all ready for. And you may want to take notes on this if you're a judge, if you're a law clerk, if you're a lawyer or anyone involved in the deep, deep dive or the deep issues associated with the Second Amendment, how to handle these kinds of cases and these matters. Okay, so to begin with, the first basic level, we all have talked about this before, the Heller methodology, the Supreme Court decided the uh, D.C. versus Heller case in 2008 uh, that set forth the interpretive methodology, meaning how we go about interpreting the Second Amendment to determine whether or not a modern day gun control law violates it. And that is simply called the text first, followed by history standard or the historical analog laws test second. So again, it's one test, text first, then history second. That's how it works. Heller did exactly this. And they that's how they interpreted. They defined the text of the Second Amendment. They defined all the key words, the right of the people to keep and bear arms in Heller. They defined uh, to keep which means to possess, they define to bear, to carry, they define armed as anything that can be used offensively or defensively, including but not limited to handguns and, and, and firearms and modern technology, anything that can be used offensively or defensively as an arm, and of course, uh, shall not be infringed means you can't violate it, right? They define all these terms as a matter of text. Now, in Nyserpa versus Bruin in 2022, the Supreme Court, of course, as you know, came out and says that the lower courts, the so-called inferior courts as defined by Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution, were misbehaving and failing to follow the interpretive methodology of Heller. And what the Supreme Court said in Bruin was that the Heller methodology of text first followed by history is what should be done in Second Amendment cases. But Bruin elaborated a little bit further on a couple of different things. One of the things they said, of course, is no more interest balancing, that the lower courts had gotten that totally wrong by doing you know tiers of scrutiny or balancing the, the good of guns versus the bad of guns. That is verboten. That's no longer allowed. That was never allowed under Heller. And Bruin made that crystal clear, for example. So Heller and Bruin are really the same methodology as to how you interpret the Second Amendment. Now, with that said, and this is the first sort of key thing I want to focus on a little bit. Text focuses on something that's slightly different than history in the context of the Second Amendment fights here. The text of the Second Amendment, of course, is defined by the Supreme Court, and we've gone over that before. But how do you know whether or not a modern-day gun control law implicates the text of the Second Amendment? And the way to actually do it is this. You look at the conduct that the American citizen wants to engage in or the conduct that the American citizen did engage in but then got arrested for and indicted for violating you know, some gun control law. If the conduct that the American citizen wants to engage in, like I want to buy an AR-15, I want to buy a magazine that holds more than 10 rounds, I want to be able to carry my gun you know, concealed in a park in New Jersey, okay? That proposed conduct, if that proposed conduct touches fingers with the text of the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep in their arms shall not be infringed, then the text is satisfied. And once the text is satisfied, as you know, the burden shifts, the burden shifts to the government. So again, 
There's two ways that happens. One is the proposed conduct implicates the text of the Second Amendment. Again, I want to buy an AR-15. I can't buy it under the state law that I'm in. And therefore, you know, it's implicating my right to keep and bear arms, i.e. a right to keep and bear an AR-15. So the Second Amendment text is implicated. That's my proposed conduct I'm now not allowed to do. Or alternatively, like in the Rahimi case, that's an example where someone engaged in the conduct, got arrested after the fact, after they did it, and that's an example saying, well, I engaged in this conduct, which is constitutional under the Second Amendment in my view. So again, in Rahimi, he was subject to a domestic violence restraining order, and then after that, he was caught possessing a firearm, and he was then arrested for having a firearm while he was subject to a domestic violence restraining order. And that's the Rahimi Supreme Court case that says that you cannot do that because the actual conduct of Mr. Rahimi touches fingers with the Second Amendment because he, you know, he he had and possessed and wanted to carry guns and that he was banned from doing so. So again, the focus on the text is on the conduct or proposed conduct of the actual American citizen. Now, once the text is satisfied, okay, the burden shifts, as you know, to the government. Now, what does the government have to do? And this is where it gets a little different. The focus of the historical inquiry while the focus of the of the textual inquiry is on the conduct of the American citizen, the proposed or the actual conduct of the American citizen, when you shift the burden to the government, the focus is not on that. The focus is actually on whether or not there is a longstanding tradition of the kind of firearms law that the that that the government is trying to justify as part of a modern day gun control law. Okay, what that means is the focus, the historical focus is on the history in the United States of the tradition of regulating firearms laws, okay? So the government has to show by looking at history, and there's a particular kind of history it has to look to, the government has to say that, yes, look at the history of American regulation of firearms, the modern day gun control law that we, the city of New, New York, uh, the state of New Jersey, the state of California, whatever it is, we think that the law that we have enacted that we want to enforce today in the year of our Lord 2023 is uh, analogous to laws that have been on the books here in the United States since the time of the founding in 1791 when the Second Amendment was adopted. So again, text focuses on the conduct of the American citizen. The historical inquiry is really on the conduct and behavior of the government going back to the time of the founding. You see how they're slightly different in terms of where the focus is, what you're studying? So keep that in mind. Text, burden shift to the government, government focus on the history of government regulations. Now, with that said, as you know, there's a particular kind of history that must be studied. The government cannot come forth and satisfy its burden with saying, I've got these, history, these history professors that have this cute story, this narrative, a story arc, airy-fairy history about what American gun law should be or was or what. No, no, no. The Supreme Court made clear in Bruin that what they want to find are actual laws. Could be case law, uh, could be common law, could be statutory law, whatever, but it has to be actual laws, actual regulations on the book at the time of the founding that were actually enforced. You see, they can't just bring in a history historian to tell a story that Abraham Lincoln was gay, which we've seen you know, historians do. We're, we can't have people come in and tell stories. No, they have to say, here's a law in Boston, here's a law in New York, here's a law in New Jersey, and here it is being enforced. Whatever it is, that's the burden the government must bear to come forth with the actual laws on the book. Now, with that said, it gets more nuanced. And this is something I wanted to talk about. I've held it back talking about, but I think in light of what's coming up with Rahimi, I want to get this detailed. Now, once the burden shifts to the government, the government has to come forth with historical analog laws. Now, let's talk for a moment about the two types of historical analog laws, the conceptual types of analog laws that the government has to come forward and when they have to come forward with it. What do I mean by that? Nicerber versus Bruin talks about two types of analogs, two con concepts of analogs. Analog laws that are dis uh, distinctly similar to the modern day gun control laws, but extended back to the 18th century. What I mean by that is laws that are distinctly similar from the time of the founding through today. 
that they're distinctly similar, very closely related. They look a lot alike. Those are what are known as distinctly similar, distinctly similar analog laws. That is different than what are known as relevantly similar, relevantly similar analog laws. We're going to break those down a little bit more in just one second. It's not going to be that confusing once we get into it. But keep in mind, there's two notions of analog laws here. Those that are distinctly similar and those that are relevantly similar. So let's start with when the government bears the burden of coming forth with historical analog laws that are distinctly similar to the modern day gun control law they're trying to uphold. Specifically, the U.S. Supreme Court in Bruin talks about when the government bears the burden to show that the modern day gun control law in the year of our Lord 2023 they want to uphold is distinctly similar to a law or set of laws that existed in 1791 during our founding. And that is very actually simple to know when they have to meet the distinctly similar standard. When is it? It's when today's modern day gun control law is attempting to address a social problem that existed from 1791 through today. For example, murder with a gun in downtown Boston in urban areas was a problem that could occur in 1791. It could occur all the way up to today. That's not a new social problem. Domestic violence exists today, yes, but domestic violence existed at the time of our founding as well. It is not a new social problem, okay? That's an example of ordinary street crime was a problem that existed in the 18th century, existed in the 19th century, exists today. Street crime. See? See the point? So what happens when a modern-day gun control law is designed by the government today to address a problem that has been with us since at least the 18th century when our country was founded in 1791, the year the Second Amendment was adopted. Well, the Supreme Court tells us that the only way that a modern-day gun control law can be justified if it's addressing a social problem that existed all the way back to the time of the founding is the historical analog law or laws that the government comes forth with to justify their modern-day gun control law must be distinctly similar to today's law. Let me read what the Supreme Court says. I think it will clarify it for you. This is what they say in Bruin. When, quote, when a challenge regulation addresses a general societal problem that has persisted since the 18th century, the lack of a distinctly similar, the lack of a distinctly similar Historical regulation addressing that same problem is relevant evidence that the challenged regulation is inconsistent with the Second Amendment. Likewise, if earlier generations addressed the societal problem but did so through materially different means than gun control, let's say, that could also be evidence that a modern regulation is unconstitutional. Do you see that? The Supreme Court is talking about if a general societal problem has persisted since the 18th century, then the government has to come forth with a distinctly similar historical regulation. And why is that? Because Bruin says, quote, the lack, the lack of a distinctly similar historical regulation addressing that same problem is evidence that the challenge regulation is inconsistent, inconsistent with the Second Amendment. Okay? So that is key. And virtually all the issues that modern-day gun control laws are supposed to deal with are issues we've seen going all the way back to the 18th century. Now, with that said, if there's a modern-day gun control law that is dealing with something that's legitimately like a brand new issue, and I, you know, we can debate this, and I'm not going to, you know, lock into anything here, but I'll give you an example of a concept. Let's say there's a debate about whether or not you can have a gun loaded, unlocked on an airplane at 30,000 feet, where that if you drop it or something, an accident takes place, and you shoot uh, the bullet, 
right? You shoot the, your ammo and the round goes, you know, through the plane and turns off the engine or hits a fuel line or hits, uh, heaven forbid, uh, you know, something that causes the plane to ignite and explode at 30,000 feet with, you know, 300 people on it. Well, that is obviously a problem that likely the founding fathers did not think about. That was a kind of a new social problem about guns on the planes themselves. And therefore, you could see a situation where, well, okay, look, that is a new societal problem that the founding fathers did not have to deal with. And as a consequence, the government, and this is why it's important, the government only has to come forth with historical analog law or laws, right? Historical analog laws showing a longstanding tradition. But here's the thing. Those historical laws can simply be relevantly, relevantly similar. See the difference? If it's an existing problem that's been, been, been with us for hundreds of years, the government bears the burden to show a distinctly, very closely related, closely knit historical analog law to justify the modern-day gun control law. But if it's a brand new problem, like you know, guns on a plane, loaded and unlocked, then perhaps there's a lesser standard the government ha can, has, can satisfy to justify the modern-day gun control law. That lesser standard is not, is not distinctly similar. It's relevantly similar, which is still, here's the key, it's still, the government still has to come forth with historical analog laws. They always have to come forth with historical analog laws going back to 1791. The only difference is that if it's a persistent ongoing problem since then, it has to come forth with the distinctly similar closely related laws to justify the gun control law, or they lose. If it's a brand new problem, then they just have to show a relevantly similar historical analog law, but they still have to show at a minimum, a relevantly similar historical analog laws. They can't go into like tiers of scrutiny or interest balance or anything like that. It still has to be a historical analog laws. Now, the way to conceptually think about the difference between a relevantly similar analog law historically versus a distinctly similar historical analog law is think about two concentric circles. Okay, don't think about metaphors like buckets. I think they're really two concentric circles. You have kind of a mid-sized circle that's relevantly similar, and within that you have a smaller circle within the bigger circle of distinctly similar. So all the historical analog laws that potentially could justify a modern-day gun control law are in that bigger circle of relevantly similar laws. But within that circle, there's a smaller circle, a subset of relevantly similar laws. Those are distinctly similar laws. So if something is a distinctly similar law, it's obviously uh, by the principles of a fortiori, also relevantly similar, but something can be relevantly similar, but not distinctly similar. And that's the key. So it's always in the in best interest of the Second Amendment community to make the job harder on the government to justify modern gun control laws. And one way to do that is to always argue in your Second Amendment cases that whatever the modern gun control law is dealing with is a problem that has been with us here in the United States since the 18th century. Because if you can establish that, you force, you are forcing the government to meet the higher standard of coming forth with historical analog law or laws that are distinctly similar to the modern-day gun control law they're trying to uphold. But if you in the Second Amendment community fail to show that it's a persistent problem going back to the 18th century and the government is able to argue to the court or wherever that no, this is a brand new problem, then uh, they will arguably get the benefit of a relevantly similar analog standard, which is easier for them to satisfy. Uh, so keep that in mind. And I just want to say one caveat here. Never forget when you're dealing with an arms ban case, such as an AR-15 ban case or a magazine ban case involving magazines holding more than 10 rounds, these are already resolved. The legal test is the in common use test by Americans for lawful purposes. If these things are in common use, which they undeniably are, by Americans for lawful purposes, which they undeniably are, then under the Heller test, uh, it's game over. They cannot be banned, period, full stop. So never allow the anti-gunners to pretend that they get to redo the Heller test by saying, well, AR-15s are new guns, blah, blah, blah. No, that doesn't work. Heller already resolved that. So don't let the anti-gunners play that game. Just a little caveat there. We'll talk a whole video about that. But again, in the short run, understand Texas focused on the American citizen's conduct. 
History is focused on the history of government regulation. If it's dealing with government regulations of something that's been around, a problem that's been around since the 18th century, it's distinctly historical, a distinctly similar analog laws. If it's something that's brand new, like maybe guns on a plane, that would be relevantly similar analog laws. These are some of the fine nuanced distinctions that I want you to start to think about. If you have a lot of questions or questions, feel free to ask me down below. I do read the bulk of the comments. It's hard for me to respond to all of them because I really get a thousand comments a day and I appreciate that. But I do read them. I promise I do read them over time and they're also very helpful. Some of you may have great ideas uh, that I sometimes use or, use or talk about with other people. So uh, if you have good thoughts, do not kid yourself. They do get used and considered even if I don't respond. So there you have it. Okay, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today at the Four Box Diary. If you haven't followed me uh, here, please do so. Don't forget to share and like this video and uh, share it with your friends and follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. And we will see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.